Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna do something that I'm actually surprised it's taken us this long to get around to doing. This is a channel focused on moving dirt and we have yet to actually talk about dirt. So today, brace, because this is gonna be riveting. We're talking about dirt. So this video is actually a request from Alan and his son Noah over at Construction Machinery Channel, which if you don't follow them, I will put a link up above so that you can go check out their channel. But they asked why are certain base materials used and what are the circumstances that certain base materials are used. I'm gonna take it a step further though and we're gonna talk about some common job site materials and kind of give you a very surface level dive into why they are used used on the job site. So the first one we're going to talk about is this guy right here. Let me hold it up in front of the camera so you guys can see it in the jar. This is what we like to call class two sand in Michigan, which by the way, one thing you're going to learn about aggregates in general, there is no standardization when it comes to aggregate naming. So from what I, by the way, I consulted with a civil engineer before I made this video and we had a really interesting conversation. Now, the reason I haven't referenced him in this video is because apparently there are some pretty strict guidelines on what he is allowed to say outside of his scope of work. And so I don't wanna get him in any trouble. But that being said, I did actually consult with a civil engineer before making this video. What I found out is at the federal level, there are standards for aggregates as far as how they have to be sized and how many fines are in them and stuff like that. But when it gets down to the state level, when it comes to the actual nomenclature of the material, there is no standardization. And that's why you have hugely varying names from aggregate from one state to another to another, even though you're probably talking about roughly the same material. So anyway, all that being said, in Michigan, this is known as class two sand. And I'm just gonna dump a little out here on my towel and hope my wife doesn't hate me for it. So this is class two sand. I wanted to get class three sand as well, but unfortunately they didn't have it in the pit I was in. They only had class two. The only main difference between class two and class three sand is class three has significantly more clay. But let's take a look at this sand. So you can see it does have some bigger aggregate in it, but you can see there are a lot of fines. There's a lot of small sand particulate. What this does is it means it's going to compact really easily. And because there are so many fines, it's going to lock in and it's gonna stabilize. Now, because it's sand, it doesn't really have the right type of fines that it will truly lock in. And you know this from going to the beach. Beach sand is really compacted because the, the water has gotten into it and it's got a lot of weight on top of it. It's fully compacted. But the second you put your foot into it, it will kind of squish out and conform to the shape of your foot. And that's the disadvantage that sand has. While it's a great base layer, it's not a good layer to go directly beneath concrete or asphalt because it doesn't distribute the weight across an area. Or the term we're gonna start using here is bridging. It doesn't bridge the weight. So this is class two sand. Uh, you can see it does have some clay in it, but like I said, class three sand, at least here in Michigan, would have significantly more clay in it. Now, the reason you would use class three over class two is it's gonna be a cheaper material from what I understand, but the disadvantage and why you would wanna go with a class two sand is the class three having a higher clay content means it's going to hold more water than the class two sand. So if you do need drainage, and drainage is important, which it is in Michigan, we are all about drainage because we have a lot of water, you're probably going to be filling any undercuts with a class two sand as opposed to a class three because they want that drainage. So that is class two. Now let's move to a different type of sand that isn't quite as common in road building, but it is a very common type of sand um, in the excavating industry, and that is 2NS. And you may know this as septic sand. So anytime you're putting in a drain field, you're generally gonna be using 2NS, and let's take a look at why. So right off the bat, comparing to the class two sand here, you can see there are almost no fines. There are a little bit right here in the middle, but at the same time, those are pretty large sand particles. And the advantage to this and the reason that this particular sand is required for septic is because this allows water to permeate this really well. There are a fair amount of voids in this material because of the particle size, which means that water can freely run through it. 
I was actually talking with a friend of mine uh, today on the phone and she was wondering if it was ever possible to use sand like against edge drain or drain tile. And what I told her was, I don't think so, but if you were going to be able to, I would think 2NS is about the only sand that you would really be able to use and it would be allowable because it allows for the drainage. Now, why don't we do that? Cost. 2NS is a pretty expensive sand because it is not something that you can kind of create. It's generally, from what I understand, again, I'm not in the pit operations or in the quarry side, but from what I understand, this is generally pulled out in veins and pockets that they find. It's not something that they actually screen to create 2NS sand, so it is a pretty expensive material. So if I had to guess, that's probably why you don't see 2NS being used in applications for drainage, like around drain tile or edge drain. So now let's step up to a different type of material that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, and it's our first stone material, and that is our friend, pea stone. So with pea stone, you're gonna see we've taken a significant step up in the particle size. And what that does for us is it gives us significantly more voids between the stone. You're also going to notice that this stone is pretty round. There aren't a lot of hard angles on this stone. And what that does is it allows it to not lock in, which if you're at all familiar with pea stone, pea stone doesn't ever lock together. You could run a roller over pea stone and immediately step on it and it would squish out around the edges. Again, going back to our beach sand, that's part of the reason beach sand does that because if you were to look at it under a microscope, it's not super angular, it's still pretty rounded. And so it doesn't allow those particles to really lock in together to make a firm base. And that's why pea stone is never going to be used in a load bearing application where you need a strong locked in base. We use it as a fill material in like basement floors and stuff like that where you don't have a tremendous amount of weight being put on it and you have something to kind of hold the edges in so that it kind of locks together to an extent. But at the same time, you're never gonna see a pea stone road base. It's just not a good material because it doesn't lock in. But for drainage, this is fantastic. And that's why pea stone is primarily used in drainage applications. So anytime you're bedding around uh, edge drain, drain tile, French drains, you're gonna be using pea stone. Anything that you need that really good drainage. So the next stone we're gonna step up to, is 6A. You're gonna notice that 6A looks a lot like pea stone on steroids, and that's pretty much what it is. There's again, you don't have a lot of fines in this material. Now I will say, in a normal application, you're probably gonna get a little bit of fines in this um, just because of the screening process. I get to be a little pickier and choosier when I go out with my mason jars and collect this stuff, so I don't have a lot of fines in this. But it is still, even if you were to go take a full loader bucket of this, you're not gonna see a lot of fines in it. This has been through a screening plan it has actually been washed to get the fines removed out of it. And the reason is this is another type of pipe bedding material that you would use in drainage systems. So this would be a great material to backfill around perforated storm pipe and stuff like that. This can also be used in some driveway applications where you need really good drainage. You will notice you have a lot of round stones. You do get a little bit of angular in there, but this overall is not going to lock in super tight. So it is not going to be a road base type material, generally speaking. That's where we step up to this guy here. This is known as 21AA, or we just call it for short 21A. So by the way, when it comes to nomenclature, you may notice the 6A 21A, 2NS is another one. What that actually refers to is the size of the screen they put on the screening plan. So that is not a designation that this particular rock is 21AA. This is the rock that falls out of the screen when it is a 21AA screen. And that's how we get some of these names for some of the materials we're talking about. It's actually because of the screens that they use in the screening plant. And that's how you can standardize to a degree the size of the aggregate that's coming out of those screening plants. You also will have different kinds of 21A. So this is, I believe, 21A natural. Um, you can have 21A crushed concrete, which is recycled crushed concrete. You can have 21A limestone. Each one of those materials is going to have different qualities. It's going to have different forces that require to break it down. As my civil engineering friend was explaining to me, 21A limestone is going to break down significantly faster in water, which if you're familiar with cave formations with stalactites and stalagmites, you'll know 
water actually erodes limestone over time. The same would happen to your 21A over time if it was your road base. So that's why you have different applications for different types of 21A material, whether it be limestone, natural, or crushed. So all that to say, the big thing that's gonna stick out here, while these are kind of round in shape, let me hold it up so you can see it, we still have a lot of angles on this. This is a very angular stone, and if I were to lay this down in a road and compact it, you would get significant compaction with this material and it would lock together really well because of the fact that it is angular. Now, again, this is not a good sample of actual 21A just because there are a fair amount of fines in 21A, but this was at the top of the pile. We've had a lot of snow. I was literally wandering around the sand pit with my mason jars like the old woman from the labyrinth. In here and see if there's anything else you'd like. Like, I didn't have time to dig through piles and actually get an accurate representation with fines because I'm pretty sure they wanted me out of there. For the record, um, this would have some fines in it. And this is one of the primary road-based materials we use in Michigan because it locks together. So what you would do is you would start with your class two sand uh, if you had any undercuts to do, and you would use the class two to bring it up to your subgrade level. Then you would actually use your 21A stone. You would put down, you know, 10, 10 to 12 inches of, of 21A stone. You would compact that, lock it in together, and then you would actually put your road over top of that. So that's kind of an overview of some of the popular materials that we use on the job. Now I'm gonna bring out another material that wouldn't fit in my jars. This guy right here, let's look at the size of those. That's one by three crushed concrete, which just a quick side note, because I thought this was cool. Uh, if you've ever heard them talk about adding fibers to concrete to reinforce it, that's what we're looking at right here. All of these little hairs are actually nylon fibers. I believe it's nylon. Um, that's used to reinforce the concrete mix. So this was in a pretty heavy application, this piece of concrete with whatever it was being used for. So anyway, just cool side note. So one by three crushed concrete is another step up and where we would most commonly use one by three crushed concrete in our industry is for mud mats or temporary construction mats that are used to knock uh, mud off the tires of trucks as they exit the job site. Now, another application you would see this used that isn't quite as common and as frequent, but it's definitely there is in a bridging application. So let's say we had really spongy ground, which by the way, this is gonna kind of tie all of this together as to why the different sizes of rock matter and when they're used. Let's say we had a super, super wet, spongy area that we needed to build a road over. If we were to just go at it with sand and with 21A, most likely what would happen is they would just sink out of sight because you would never get a strong enough base. It doesn't lock together to the point that we could drive a truck over top of it, even if it were two feet thick, it would have enough cohesion that it wouldn't allow the truck to sink. That's getting back to that term, the bridgeability. So what you would do instead is we would lay down some geofabric, which is another, I will, I will flash a picture of a road with geofabric down. Basically geofabric, it's it's like putting LGP tracks on whatever material you're throwing down. The whole idea is widen the surface area and create this barrier that will distribute the weight of the material so it doesn't push down into the mud. So that's when we would use the fabric. So if we had this super spongy material we were trying to get over top of, we would lay down a layer of fabric and then we would start with a pretty good course, like maybe a couple feet of one by three crushed concrete. And the reason we do that is because I can cover, you know, a six inch span with these and it's all gonna lock together. And that six inch span is gonna hold some weight. Versus if I did the same thing with this, you can see that little six inch span, I can put my finger right down the middle and I'm gonna be able to push that down in the mud. These larger aggregates have a much higher level of bridgeability. You can actually carry more weight across a bigger distance with larger aggregate, which makes sense because if we started dropping boulders in that area, obviously it's gonna be really difficult to shove a boulder down into the muck. Now, the downside is you can't grade this. We can't take one by three and get it within a half or even a quarter tenth of accuracy so that we can lay down concrete or asphalt over top of it. And that's when we're going to step up to our other materials. 
So we would again, we would put down our fabric, we would put down our one by three crushed, we would most likely put down another layer of fabric just to keep the two materials from mixing too bad. And then we would put our 21A over top of that. And now we have a very, very strong base underneath a very highly locked in but gradable base. And then we can put our asphalt over top of that. So that is a quick summary, believe it or not, of aggregates and what they are and when they're used and how they're used. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope I haven't bored you too badly, but at the same time, obviously, if you have any questions or if you're a civil engineer and I have totally botched something, by all means, put that down in the comments. Let's all learn from this because I am, I put the stuff down, but I've never actually gone into the science and how this all works. So I found this kind of interesting, but I very well could have gotten some stuff wrong on this. So comment down below. We'll catch you guys on the next video.